I'm Jay Camiso, and as part of the Center for Ethics video series in partnership with the Varsity, I interviewed Barbara Jackman, a Canadian lawyer specializing in immigration and refugee law and national security law. She's an alumni at the University of Toronto Law School and is currently practicing at the firm Jackman, Nazami and Associates. Why don't I start by, by just explaining that I got into this as a student at the University of Toronto. It wasn't like I planned to do this, to practice this area of law, but because I worked at the clinic through the law school, there were a lot of new immigrants to Canada that had problems, a lot of refugee problems. And so as a student, I became involved in helping people and just decided to continue doing it. And it was through that work that you realized that probably the most vulnerable people in Canada um, are one of the most vulnerable classes of people in Canada are immigrants, people who um, are not citizens, don't have a right to vote, and it, it, a lot of them don't even have legal status in the country. So trying to sort of advance their rights to get the government to recognize that they had to be treated fairly, that they couldn't send them back to torture, that when they deported someone they had to think about what would happen to their children, those kinds of issues arising cases, and that's the kind of law I've been involved in arguing those cases before the courts. If a permanent resident or foreign national in Canada is suspected of terrorism, serious crimes, or human rights violations, the Canadian government may issue the individual's security certificate, which means the individual may be subject to indefinite detention and deportation. Initially, there wasn't a process at all. You'd, you'd go in with the client to the, the immigration department and they'd say, oh, you have to leave Canada. Why? I can't tell you why. <laughs> because it was all a big secret and there wasn't a hearing. So to, to give the government credit, it tried to create a system where at least they had a hearing. They could go and a judge who's independent would look at their case and make a decision on whether or not the person was a threat to Canada's security. The problem is, is, is that the government created this secret process where the mm -hmm. judge and the government lawyer would see the evidence, but the person and their lawyer never saw it at all. So-called in-camera. Yeah, it's ex parte and in-camera, mm -hmm. so without anybody else, you're on your own. Um, that proved to be really unfair because the judge doesn't know the person's case, and the judge is the only one there who's supposed to be separate from the government. The, and the judge is supposed to decide if, if any information can be released. So they weren't releasing any information, just newspaper articles, but nothing of substance that the person could respond to. So sometimes you'd go into a hearing, you, you had no idea really what it was they thought the person had done because they couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. That eventually went to the Supreme Court on whether that's a fair process. And the Supreme Court said, look, we can see that there's a need for secret evidence sometimes, but the person has to have an advocate in the secret hearing. And so they, they decided that it wasn't fair the way it was structured. They left it to the government to figure out how to make it fair. And they put in a new system in which they appointed lawyers that are called special advocates. Bills through Bill C-3. Yeah. yeah, and those lawyers are security cleared. They meet with the person before they go into the hearing. They can ask questions and argue that evidence should be released. And to be honest, it's like night and day. Like we started getting evidence. We started getting summaries of the problems. We still don't get all the evidence. And, um, and in that sense, I think it, it would be a lot fairer if the, if the real um, first starting point was you release the information and only exceptionally do you keep it secret because they're still keeping way too much information mm -hmm. secret. Um, but uh, it's better process now than it was. The other problem with that security certificate process was it, it had mandatory detention. So that's one of the things for me as a lawyer that made it the worst because Canada was creating victims of mm -hmm. cruel treatment by these, these, this kind of provision. We had clients five, six, seven years in jail in solitary five years. I mean, Canada putting someone in solitary. I went to court in the Hassan Omri case. He was in solitary in the Toronto West Detention Centre, a cold cement building where the guards wore jackets in the winter time. We had to go to court to get the right for him to wear running shoes in solitary confinement. They had him in stocking feet in the winter when the guards were wearing jackets and he's in this orange jumpsuit, jumpsuit in, in socks. The court ordered that they give him shoes. But imagine having to go to court in Canada to get shoes for a prisoner. Like I actually, in that case, I got emails from people from like all over the world saying, what, what's Canada doing that people can't wear shoes when they're in jail? It was really ridiculous. 
But so it, I mean, it was very difficult to see to mm -hmm. to watch your client and their family members sort of slowly break down over the years, and and have a hard time being able to do anything to really help them because it took it takes so long to get to court. So. You know, the, the, the law passed in 92, it wasn't until 2007 that the Supreme Court said it was unlawful, that they couldn't do that, there was no mandatory detention, it wasn't fair, and that they had to have a hearing where the person understood, was given enough information that they would know the case against them. But, um, you know, I represent refugees, and so I see the results of torture in other countries, and I, uh, Canadians, Canadian officials weren't torturing, but when you're detained indefinitely, a lot of the time, years on end in solitary confinement, and you never know when it's going to end. Mm -hmm. That's cruel. It is. Mm -hmm. And so... It, Even with ordinary judicial review of the case. Yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't so. end. And so in, in, in some cases, I mean, by the time the, the security certificate's upheld, it's challenged in court, the court overturned it, and then they can't be removed anyways. Like some of the securities, or two of them are from Egypt. You can't send them back to Egypt. Egypt will detain and torture them. Hassan Omri was from Syria. You can't send him back. He won his case ultimately. So they were coming from countries where they weren't going to be safe. And so it makes you wonder why does the government do that? Fight so these cases so hard when at the end of the day you know you can't remove the person because it's not fair. You can't send someone to torture. So they're very difficult cases, those kind of cases. I, I think that now, I don't think the government will use the security certificate as often. Mm -hmm. I think they'll, mm -hmm. rarely, rarely, but, but they're doing the same thing in a worse way in some ways because those secret hearings now aren't even in front of judges. They're in front of people who often used to be former prosecutors and they're civil servants at the immigration oh. division. And they're the ones that are making the decision on these kind of cases now. Well, that was another episode of the Center for Ethics video series, What's Philosophy Got to Do With It, in collaboration with The Varsity. I'm really excited to move forward with this project um, with my fellow undergraduate fellow, Victoria Wicks, so we can speak with more distinguished academics and professionals in the field of ethics, such as Barbara Jackman. Thank you for watching.